This podcast is brought to you by Pragmatic Solutions, the leading iGaming PAM platform with a modular approach, including many benefits like a fast, secure, and scalable API-based platform integrated with all major third-party products and services. Make sure you head over to Pragmatic Solutions and join our smart thinking. This podcast is brought to you by Pragmatic Play, a leading game developer providing player favorites to the most successful brands across the industry. With an award-winning multi-product portfolio of slots, live casino, bingo, virtual sports, and more, Pragmatic Play is powering up new possibilities of play through one single API. Visit pragmaticplay.com and discover your favorite every time. So, James Carvel, new CEO of uh, Yggdrasil, here on the podcast today for a deep dive of the company. How are you doing, James? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Thanks for awesome. seeing me today. It's an absolute pleasure. And uh, as we just spoke about here before, welcome to Malta. After 20-something odd years in the iGaming industry, you finally managed to get yourself to the mecca of iGaming uh, uh, here. Yeah, no, I'm really looking forward to it. And I've, <laughs> I've been here since October, and I actually love living here. It's uh, really enjoyable. Yeah, it's, uh, it's much easier than I thought. It's uh, it's a, actually a great place. It's super vibrant. Uh, I'm living, you know, like five minutes from my office as well, yes. which also helps. Yeah, yeah, it's a great place to be here. Be here in Malta. Uh, so, so James, uh, today we are going to do a deep dive on Yggdrasil. And um, you know, for myself, I've uh, been in industry now for quite some time, and I've seen kind of the. Uh, uh, the the, the um, industry evolving throughout the years and I remember really clearly when Frederick started Yggdrasil back in the day you know I used to work for Betson in the t- early 2010s oh, right. and uh, at that time we had Casino Red and Casino Black and it was uh, essentially NetEnt and Microgaming and those were the only two providers that we used at that time but Frederick was really a part of this kind of like new generation of game studios that came after the launch of the shared wallet that kind of opened up operators to use yeah, many, more, many more um, game studios. Um, and so, so James, now you have taken over as the CEO of Yggdrasil. Um, can you start uh, to talk just about your, your own background uh, of the industry? You've obviously been in the industry for a very long time, but it'd be great yeah. to know. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 uh, I started over 30 years ago, so I was... Um, I must be one of the the oldest veterans in it. Um, so I, I started off as a croupier uh, in in London, and uh, I was a dealer, and I went abroad and came back, and then I ended up running casinos in Mayfair for for twenty years um, at places like the Ritz, and yes. um, and then I, I saw that there was a transition in in players and and how players were behaving, and uh, less customers were. KYC and everything else became more difficult in land-based and um, technology was catching up and I just wanted to make a transition. I saw that there was an opportunity to, to do a transition and, and I, took a, I took a job at William Hill um, in 2011 and, and, and moved to, to Gibraltar. And, um, and I think I was really lucky um, to, to do that because I joined at a time where it was download casino. So there was no mobile games. I, I got to live through and, and work at William Hill through um, with some great people actually and live through the, the first games of, of HTML5 and mobile and so I'd, I got to learn at the same time as technology was evolving and um, and and so that has been a, a fantastic journey since you know William Hill and uh, and then time at Superbet I did my own studio for a, a few years and then um, uh, and then OPAP um, uh, contacted me and, and asked if I'd like to to go there and, and run um, their online division. So um, and which also included lottery, I lottery, and, and which is something I hadn't done before. So it was a great experience. So really enjoying myself there. Um, had fantastic growth at that company, and, and then I got a call to see if I was interested <laughs> in joining Igrasil. And, and Igrasil is a, a brand that I've always admired, and I think has a you know, a warm place in a lot of people's hearts. They they, they cheer for it. Um, it's always been known as being uh, like an innovation brand. Um, and, you know, yes, it's had um, some hard times over the last couple of years, but I think that it's a brand that people really get behind. And I, and I think that there's a lot of stuff that can be done with it going forwards. Right. And this really feels like 
it's kind of like the rebirth of uh, of the brand to some extent. We, we're going to talk a little bit later on the reconstruction that uh, yeah. that you are undertaking right now. But I want to take a step back, as you pointed out here, that Yggdrasil has had a couple of uh, difficult uh, years. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Yggdrasil was part of this new generation of game studios. It's kind of uh, rose to fame really quickly. It's uh, it became a household brand in our industry. It did really well, but then seemingly the brand started to kind of lose its edge a bit, it, it, it felt like. Um, can, can you go back to, to that a little bit, uh, James, and talk about like what happened there during those years, uh, actually, that's ill, and you know, how are you now planning to bring the brand back? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that <clears throat> there, was a, there was a strategy at the time um, to, you know, uh, a few years ago to, to bring the studios together because there was different studios in different locations and, and to create like a, an IT hub in, in Krakow. <clears throat> which is which is which was a good idea um and you know that that transition happened and then covid hit and and doing all of those transitions at the same time and going from a some companies did really well during covid mm -hmm. because they were good at um managing um working from home and some other companies struggled and doing that transition at that same time <clears throat> i think had a, a negative effect there was a lot of attrition of of staff during that period as well and um, so some of the the skill sets and the learnings that the the team had, had you know uh, left the business uh, and, I, and I think that the the, the team struggled from there um, a little bit with with quality and uh, and game performance and um, but I, I think that what's happened now is that you know in a, in a very short t period of time we've kind of done a restructure and we have everyone in place now to accelerate again yeah. yeah, it's exciting times uh, now, James. Can we talk a little bit more about uh, this uh, reconstruction that you're undergoing? You have a couple of different bullet points. I know <coughs> a reconstruction is not just about replacing individuals, right? It's so much more than, than that in order to really get to the root of... Yeah, I mean, it's sometimes uh, the, uh, um, when, you're, when you're looking at the structure of a company and how you need to do things going forward, I think one of the things you have to look at is, is what is your strategy and how you think and how you want your people to think. And... One of the things that we've installed is is like a the a, a new four pillar system where, you know, we're we're thinking about efficiency, we're thinking about sustainability, um, new new product and and disruptive innovation. And if anyone's working on something that doesn't cover one of those, <laughs> they're doing the wrong thing. So, so part of the new restructuring is is making it leaner and, and so that we can go faster. Um, using new tools and new AI, you know, to to make sure that, you know, we're we're ahead of the the competition and and, you know, we're we're really utilizing the things out there. I mean, one of the things, you know, really on a on a basic way is, you know, you think of Jira and Confluence, you know, the the the, the um, product management tools that people have been using for years. But you know, you go you go and look at the states. You know who are at the cutting edge of of um, project management and design and and they're moving to different companies and, and we're doing the same so we're moving to a um, a company called ClickUp where they will be we will use their tools to to project manage everything within our company and um, so we will go from like a, a customer code uh, to see all the workflows um, within the whole company, you, you'll be able to just click on a project and be able to see everything. You'll see where the blockers are. Um, you see the people who are struggling and the people who are doing well. And I think, you know, in, in a new age where a lot more people are working from home, you need to have these type of tools in order to, to manage your business better. And, and this is one of the things that we're focusing massively on. Um, I think we've also made some strategic changes in some of our people. So I've, I've brought in um, Alex Haywood. Um, he's, um, he's our new managing director of, of Poland. We didn't have a senior member on the ground uh, in Krakow. So he's, he's moved there uh, recently and we've added some strength into that team. And uh, I think that, you know, he's, he comes with a, you know, a really good history. He was at Evolution for many years in, in charge of infrastructure. Um, He's built crypto platforms in the last few years. He's built streaming platforms in the last few years. So like he's at the cutting edge of technology. And I, and I think that that's where we want to be. And, and we're using the tools to help us across our business in order to, to, to achieve that. Yeah. And, and so it sounds a, a little bit like um, 
on the one hand, uh, you are getting some really senior members of the team in, in now who can uh, who can uh, be a part of this uh, change and also changing some of the legacy tech. Let's say that, uh, as you pointed out earlier, you are going from a company that is um, kind of structured to work together to a company that uh, can work remotely and, and, uh, and that it's not just about being comfortable as an individual to work remotely, but uh, the, uh, the structure within the company has to allow for uh, for that yeah, one. absolutely. And and our, our new project is is Project Phoenix, which is all to do with our platform. And like you said, it's like a rebirth, you know, and that's why we chose the Phoenix. name Phoenix. <laughs> um, and, you know, Phoenix is that we have a really good platform, uh, 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 which is on good technology. But um, if you, uh, you need to accelerate always and you need to look at how to be better always and and there are you know new tools in the market that allow you know tasks that are done repetitively can be done by robots now so which means that the engineers can then spend time on doing tasks that really need to be done and the jobs that need to be done by the top engineers need to be prioritized and done in the right way so so we're looking at all of these things to to be more tech focused um and you know we have we have some projects within project phoenix like uh we called it ygg formula and it's we've basically built a a, a tool um which accelerates our slots uh um production so it means that we get better quality um it allows us to launch uh, faster um and we we think that we'll be able to you know turn around slots within four months where it used to take us eight oh, okay. um and and that's that's happened really fast and we think that you know by the end of q1 that will be in production already you know the other one of the other projects we're doing is is uh, uh ygg nest you know which is we've listened to the customers the customers you know the, the back office of of yggdrasil hasn't changed for many years and and the back office is the tool that all of our customers use every day and we're we're, we're live with 800 brands and um and, and that means that, you know, the, the customers need to use tools that are easy to use and, and simple and um, and transparent. And so one of the other um, projects that we're doing is, is and we called it Nest because, again, it's that, that rebirth of Phoenix um, to, to give a new back office to the team. And, and that will be uh, done this year as well. So, you know, there's, there's lots of things that will happen behind the scenes. Um, uh, to help us accelerate. I think one of the other things is that I'm really happy that, that Mark McGinley is with us. He's um, our chief product officer. Uh, he joined just before me and, and he comes with, you know, over 20 years of experience in the industry. And, you know, he's starting to put all of his new processes in place to make that, you know, our, our teams, you know, stronger and faster and, you know, raising the quality of our games, you know, so, so every time we launch a game and we can tell people about it, you know, we're really proud of that. And, and the first game Rainbow Ryan two is, is the, like the new benchmark of games going forward. And that, that will be launching on uh, February the 23rd. Yeah. I wanted to, to go into this, you know, there's a lot of restructuring happening behind uh, behind the scenes, uh, new systems that are being in use, new protocols, new processes, so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, um, what matters are the games, uh, right? And, Correct. Uh, the quality Always. of the games. Always. So, so um, can you talk more about, uh, uh, you mentioned the game that you uh, that will be kind of the first game of this new kind of rebirth of the, of the brand, but can you talk more about how will the games be different and uh, what can your customers and your players expect from Yggdrasil in 2024 uh, compared to 2023, let's say? Yeah, I mean, I think that we've, we've uh, in 2023, we, we launched 20 games and, and I think the teams were really stretched to, to push as many games out as possible. And, and um, I think that we've, we've sat down and, and reevaluated what's important and uh, quality of the games is, is is paramount, and we've reduced that now to one per month. And I think that that means that we can test all of our games so much longer um, and fine tune them to the the nth degree in order to make sure that you know we're we're super proud of everything that goes out. And, and that and to support all of our games going live on a monthly basis, we're launching YGG twenty three, which is our which is our new marketing uh, um, uh, around our, our premium games. So mm -hmm. on the 23rd of every month, 
um, from now on is our premium game release. So, so we will own that day. You know? right. So, so every operator out there will know on the twenty third of every month is the day that Igrasil yeah. launched their premium game of the month. And, that's and I Igrasil think day. That's Igrasil day. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and then that that gets supported by, you know, the the marketing team who will be going out um, and, and speaking to the operators on that day and sending cupcakes to everyone and yeah. merchandise but you know th that's the day that we're going to get behind every month and, and that also creates a space for us you know in, in this very busy market um where everyone is launching content all the time and and pitching to operators for 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 space um you know we will create our own space you know by by doing that and, and innovation and in isn't just in your games creation it's about how you market and how you create a space for yourself to to be successful and um and, and that's part of this right so um you know most people or all people they have their birthday once a year they have uh, have the monthly uh, yes day. exactly so, yeah, we're gonna have space. 12. i love it i think yeah. that's earlier you're, you're celebrating something every month I like yeah it. Uh, so um this is a part also of a kind of a, a a marketing and branding effort within the organization um uh, as well so you know, if we take a step back and look at the uh, game development uh, sphere from a helicopter view, there are hundreds of game studios uh, today in the industry, right? Some are huge, some are smaller, and games are being launched on a continuous basis every single day. Um, in that context, with all that noise happening, uh, can you talk more about how do you, uh, um, how do you claim space uh, and how do you get visibility in this really chaotic uh, kind of industry? You talked about YGD23. Yes. That's a great step, right? Do you, do you have more kind of thoughts? Yeah, I mean, the, like the other thing is is that uh, we have a, uh, a new commercial director who's joined and, and the new commercial team. Um, uh, Jose uh, has, has joined us and he has years of experience. And um, one of our USPs going forward will be our, our customer service. You know, um, I think it's something in this crowded space, space that a lot of companies don't focus on. Yeah. Um, and you know, we our USP has always been our our uh, our design. You know, everyone's always loved the design and the high quality of the art that we have. We now have you know better maths and uh, in our games um, going forward. And but it also has to come with customer service, like knowing your customers, knowing what they want, being able to do bespoke uh, deals with people, um, being able to um, be on the end of a phone when there's an issue. Um, I think all these things are, are super important now. And, um, and, and like you said before, like in a, in a world that's gone remote, you know, the, the team will be doing lots more face to face, actually, you know, the, the, the idea is that that team will be traveling all year round, you know, visiting our, our customers and, and making sure that we listen to them and, and see to their needs. Right. Okay. So, so James, if we look at the incumbents of the industry, we have the uh, Pramatic Plays, the uh, Evolutions, the Light and Wonders and so on and so forth. And uh, they are consistently eating a bigger and bigger part of the uh, the uh, the wallet uh, of, of the operators uh, can you talk a, a bit more like how do you go against that trend how do you go up against that? how do you compete against these ginormous incumbents of the industry yeah i mean i i think that those companies have done fantastic um they all had their own usps um which which helped them um and whenever you're competing with with the goliaths of, of any industry you have to have disruptive innovation and I'm really happy to to announce that we have done a deal with Hungry Bear for their their Slot Masters product, and the the Slot Masters product is unique innovation in the market. So it, it's peer to peer slot play, and um, the slot games are are battles where you battle two other players, and at the moment uh, that's only offered uh, free to play, and we will be. Uh, offering that free to play everywhere and when i was at opap i think i was the first person to take that product and we had right. we had a huge loyalty i mean over 40 percent of our base was playing slot masters every day you know regardless of their value whether they were low value customers or high value customers and we we did tournaments and gave gave prizes every day on the back of it and that drove uh, a huge amount of uh, customer loyalty into our into our website so um, so I, I know it works as a loyalty product on the free to play, but, uh, but we're going to be launching the real money worldwide. 
And I think this is massive yes. disruptive innovation. And, and it's a product that they've been working on for three years. Mm -hmm. And I think that it would be really difficult for anyone to, to follow, even if they try to do it fast. And the, the great thing about slot masters is I think a lot of people, you know, everyone's seen a massive decline of poker online. Um, and, you know, I used to play poker as well. Oh, you made online. Yes. Yeah. And, and the thing is, is that we all ended up being the fish because the sharks were eating all of us because people are playing with with computers and yep. and it became unfair. And but people like peer to peer play. And this is the first time that there's going to be a product that people can use. That's a, a slot product where people can play a slot game. And they're playing against two other people and they can steal their money. They can freeze their, their reels. Um, and, you know, the, the winner out of, out of that gets paid. And, and I think that this is one of the things that we're looking at. We're looking for disruptive uh, opportunities in the market. And, and this is the first one. And, we've, and I'm really happy to say that, that we, we've signed them up um, globally. So, um, and this would be a product that would be launching hopefully in, in H1 of this year. And, um, and I think that's how we will make a space for ourselves. Right. And, and I think, and when we talk about the others like Games Global, you know, they have, you know, nearly 50 studios plugged in. We have our own masters um, studios. Um, we offer the, the same service, but we, we haven't expanded massively with our masters. and. Uh, the capacity of our, our new platform under Phoenix means that we can plug in so many more studios. So, you know, one of the things that we'll be looking for is 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 making sure that we're available to be an aggregator for, for so many more studios. We have two businesses. We have one which is our core games um, and, and under YGG23, people will know that the 23rd of every month is our is our platinum core game. And but at the same time, we have some really good masters studios under our aggregation platform, and we'll be pushing those a lot more. Um, and we will welcome in a lot more studios to come in uh, because we have the capacity to do it with our new technology. Right. So so again, going uh, back to this point that uh, there, there there are hundreds of game studios in the industry today. Many of them are smaller. They don't necessarily um, are that excited about carrying the um, the commercial part of the business. So then they can instead plug into uh, Yggdrasil and let you take care of commercial exactly. for them. They can focus on game production. Yeah, I mean, like I said, we have we have, um, we have have so many operators plugged into us. We have a new, you know, super hungry commercial team. Um, and, you know, even, even uh, we've even transformed the way that we look at legal. We turn contracts around in, in, you know, an incredibly short amount of time, you know. So, you know, all of the things we're trying to do uh, are to to be leaner and faster and more competitive and um, and I'm sure pragmatic and evolution and games global know that when you get to a really big size you, you become a warship and it, it's really difficult to turn quickly and <laughs> that that's why that's why the team now is is focusing on being lean so that we can you know we can steer our run ship faster and uh, see see new opportunities right interesting uh, uh, Jameson you, you talked about uh, the importance of disruptive innovation, and uh, in the um, in the slot uh, world, in the last you know twenty or fifty or a hundred years, uh, there hasn't necessarily been that much innovation taking place. We still see Correct. real based games. We see grid uh, based games, and obviously, Mega Race was uh, was one of those um, innovations that came during the two thousand tens. But um, when you think about innovation in the in the slot world, you talk about the peer to peer gaming for example is that a trend that you see emerging is it, do you, yeah, do you have sure. any other perspectives on innovation no i think i think that that's that's peer to peer has to be looked at um, and I, I think it's it's a niche that that hasn't been exploited especially in in the slots world and i think that that's something that we will go after strongly um, but it doesn't mean that we will rest there you know we're we're exploring different jackpot models at the moment about how jackpots can change in the future. Um, but I think also when, because I've, I've spent a lot of time as a, as an operator rather than as a supplier, I think one of the things that I, I was able to do, we had, you know, huge teams of, you know, of analysts who used to spend hours and hours looking at customer behavior. And I, and I would say that, that, you know, since COVID has happened, customers have changed. They're looking for more entertainment, definitely. 
they're not willing to spend 400 spins to get into a bonus round um they're they're looking for um you know a, a an even mix of aspirational prizes and achievable prizes whereas i think if you go back five years ago it was just aspiration only and so you know it the, the games of the future have to be something that gives something all the time and uh and so it, it doesn't have to be massive innovational change. It has to be following the trend of the customer. And I think that that's, that's what we will do. We will learn about our customers and, and the players that play our games. And we will start servicing, you know, the, um, the, the actual players, you know. So if, if they're after a, an equal mix of aspirational prizes and achievable prizes then, then that's what we're going to start building and i think that the games you will see this year are, are more of that flavor right and uh, another potential kind of disruptive uh tool to be used is uh, generative ai now in the, especially yeah, in the last year uh, since yeah. the launch of mid journey and uh and uh, chat gpt this has been on everyone's lips and what i hear is that many or most of the studios today are um, are using MidJourney and other tools to, uh, to to produce the graphical assets, um, audio assets, and so on. Uh, how do you guys think about the use of AI? Uh, we're 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 all in. <coughs> so um, so I mean, even ClickUp has AI in in, in it, and um, I think it transforms the way that that we will build slots in the future. It will also transform how we market mm -hmm. ourselves. Um, it transforms, you know, uh, using. <coughs> Uh, robots for uh, uh, to do the the general tasks um, and you know even uh, um, just before Christmas I, I, I spent some time at, at, um, uh, speaking to in San Francisco speaking to some people at OpenAI about you know what does the future look like and mm -hmm. um, uh, and and it's accelerating and you know we, we need to be at the cutting edge of that you know at the moment you can you can have um, uh, graphically, you know, we can we can go and get images really fast, and we can design images really fast. But we haven't been able to do anything else apart from that, you know. So, but in in a year's time, in two years' time, maybe we'll be able to do you know really amazing animations really quickly in in days, not not weeks or months. So we need to be at the cut, uh, at the front of looking for those new innovations and those new technologies all the time, so that. Um, so that we don't go behind, you know. Yeah. If you, if you're not moving forwards, hmm. you're you're going backwards. Right, and it's interesting that you say that, uh, James, because uh, in the conversations that I've had with um, developers in the in the world of AI and uh, development agencies that are uh, that are trying to pitch um, the use of AI into organizations, um, they they always come back and they say that. Uh, the bigger organizations, the bigger they are, the more resistant they are to yeah. uh, incorporate AI and kind of these new tools and new ways of working. Uh, whereas the uh, smaller, more hungry companies and the up and comers are much more eager to uh, uh, to take on board these new tools. For sure, and and you know we we are eager. And if there's anyone at our company that's not eager, they shouldn't be there. You know, yeah. so um, it's super important to be at the front and I, I think that some of the big companies you know are always scared because people are trying to look after their jobs right so right. if uh if you're a copywriter and you now have chat <laughs> gbt4 you know <laughs> scary it, it, it's scary right but but actually rather than being scared you should embrace and and if you embrace you can show that you can actually do four times the amount you know on your own and show that you have so much extra value because you're at the front of uh of embracing that technology and and you know we we have a younger team at uh, Idrisil now and uh, of you know full of hungry people who are trying to embrace all of the new technologies that are out there now so we will try we will try more right so you haven't had this resistance let's say from designers and so on who take a lot of pride in designing figures themselves no, no i mean actually prompting. actually the opposite i mean um uh, ygg formula which is our, our new slot um uh, maker it is all based on using ai so um and, and we're trying to embrace that and, and it's not a six 12 month project we're we're doing it in weeks 
because we're we're looking at new ways of using technology so so we're, we're actually super excited about the future and you know i, I want people to look I, I would like to have a conversation in a year from now where people yeah. are going oh wow look at what you did you right. know um and so you know you you have to be forward looking you yeah. know if you you look in history at any company that wasn't forward looking kodak nokia you know they uh, blackberry you know they they right. all failed right because yeah. they didn't keep looking uh to to move forward so yeah we can't risk that for this company oh no it'd be interesting to see and in, in a year's time two years time where this leads because you could also imagine that uh, with the democratization of um design for slot games it will also open up for a lot of studios to produce uh, a lot of uh, a, a, a lot of um, a lot more games uh, cheaper at the same time so so um, the uh, kind of maybe we are just behind a kind of new wave of massive amount of uh, yeah games sure and, and that's that's why one of the things that we're working on with our with our platform in project phoenix is being able to to handle so many more games a year and um uh, with, our, with our masters, we want to be able to offer hundreds of games uh, uh, a month if yeah. needed, right? If, if that's what the need was. So, um, and the, the technology is there already and, uh, you know, the availability is there already. And, and like I said, you know, we're, we're looking forward to adding a lot more studios into our masters and, and, and giving them access to the tools that we have so that they can build so much quicker. Yeah. One thing you mentioned earlier, James, is that you are actually um, decreasing the amount of games that you are producing in 2024 yeah. compared to 2023. And I suppose um, this is uh, um, th this is something that goes against uh, most other um, game suppliers that are trying to focus on producing more and more games. Uh, and so I want to ask you, you know, how important is it for you to focus on potential games that can become the next big hit yeah. to say for the company versus um, developing games um, at volume that all kind of perform mediocrely. Let's say. Yeah, and I think this is one of the things that, you know, it, it might have been the strategy of, of Yggdrasil um, before to just launch lots of games in that way. Um, but actually, if you if you have a look at, you know, the top 10 performing games or the top 50 performing games, they, they, they take most of the pot. Um, and so this year, I think that we need to, you know, really showcase how strong we are and so while we will have some other games they won't be our premium game you know the the, the team is working on 12 absolutely top class premium games per year and um because i, I think that that's super important we're, we're we're trying to build blockbuster games and uh and that's the job of the company yeah so no and mediocrity uh, none just fo focus on no, there's no room for it anymore uh, uh. there's no room for it and um and th there's a there's a high demand for for quality and and in, in when you have a look at how many games are consumed in, and if you get three days at the top in a, posi in, a in a good position and then your game dies you know <laughs> if you, if you don't have a fantastic quality game it doesn't stick oh. and uh, um, we 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 are a hundred percent committed to building yeah. spectacular games going forward right and. It must be also um, quite important to build on those uh, on those legacy brands that you have been successful with in the past, the follow-up games and yeah. uh, so on, right? Yeah, I mean, th Just and like th this year we will have Raptor Two, we have Valley Gods uh, Three. So you know, there's there's sequel games coming out this mm. year. R Rainbow Ryan is is yeah, number two coming one. out. Mm. So we've this year's um, this year's roadmap is really focusing on the games that people loved before. And, and launching a sequel uh, of that that's that's so much better, right. and um, uh, and you know, and I think that that's that's super important for a company to because people remember our games, right? Yep. And um, and so that you can create a space for yourself if you've had a blockbuster game, you can create a space for yourself by launching a sequel. You can't do it every every month, but you know having a having a, a sequel to your strongest performing games you know on a quarterly or half yearly basis is i think is important yeah. how do you think about the brand itself uh, uh james as Grasil, uh, so if we look at the industry today we have uh, some of the um, slow providers are 
quite generic. They will produce all types of games uh, without really a red thread between them. Yeah. Then you have others like, uh, let's say, No Limit City, which are really niche and uh, you know you always know what you can expect from them. And the yes. brand is really kind of well defined. If you look at Yggdrasil, uh, how do you want people to think about the brand moving forward? Is there any red thread? Is there any USBs? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've, we've just, uh, we're in, in uh, Rainbow Ryan 2, we're launching our new UX UI for our games and that will be our our new uh, our new UX of what people can expect in the future so it's a it's a better look and feel works far better in in uh, mobile portrait um, I think that you know we haven't launched a Vikings game for a couple of years and I think people know us for Viking games so I think you can expect <laughs> more Viking games from us um, that's, that's the name as well exactly yeah, yeah, right so a... I think <laughs> that um, you know we, we mustn't forget our brand and, and what it means um people expect innovation style content from us they expect incredibly high quality artwork and they expect some vikings every now and again <laughs> as well so um so i think that as a brand i i, I want to be seen as you know um disruptive and innovative and fun and and i think that 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 you know th those core values uh are being built into our culture going forward um, so that people will feel that when they when they play our content. Right, right. It would be a crime, I think, for a brand that is uh, from the Nordic mythology, the Gazilla tree, to not have Vikings. Uh, for, uh, for sure, the world. <laughs> for sure. And and that's that's the first conversation I had with Mark when I joined. You know, where's, more more Vikings. <laughs> give me more Vikings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. <laughs> that's in the contract. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, so James, we have uh, we have Ice coming up now, of course. Uh, the last one happening in London here before Ice move on to uh, uh, to Barcelona from 2025. Obviously, the biggest show of the year. For and, sure. Um, how so, so? This is kind of like the. It feels like it's like the coming out kind of period now for for Igda Silver. You are launching a lot of these new initiatives and yes. news are coming out. Um, how what are you planning for Ice this year? What can operators expect? Yeah, we, we, we've done it completely different. Yeah. So um, I think that uh, we, we really want to look after our customers, right? This is the, the, this is the number one thing that we want to do. So what we've done is it, in order to support our master studios for, for our aggregation platform, we have a stand inside ICE um, that, we, that we give free to our masters. So anyone that joins us, the, the top master studios get get to be on a stand uh, and and showcase their game. So we have a master stand inside ICE. Um, but what we decided to do is take over Tapa Tapa. So it's the it's the restaurant that everyone knows to go for good food at ICE, right. uh, which is always a struggle. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's literally right outside the door of ICE and we've taken over Tapa Tapa for three days. And, oh, nice. um, so it's it's all branded. It's um, all of our commercial team are gonna be there, including myself and, and uh, Mark and Alex and uh, uh, Jose and we're, we're, we're there to look after our customers, yeah. you know? So it's about building relationships. Um, it's about uh, giving a better service. We have live bands on um, Tuesday and Wednesday. We have uh, an open bar. Um, we have uh, uh, magicians and, and food all day. Yeah. And then Thursday, we're actually doing all day breakfast because we know Thursday is normally <laughs> the tough day for everyone. So uh, Smart. so if anyone has a hangover, you know, we, we welcome those operators to come in and, and our clients so we can give them a, a pick up and <laughs> breakfast in the morning. So, but it's, it, it's about, you know, our new USP going forward needs to be our, our care and attention to our, to our clients. And, um, and this is the first showcase of that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I would say what a smart uh, objective we had to take over the most popular restaurant device to make your competitors hungry. That, exactly. Uh, that is that will make you stand I mean, when, out more than anything. <laughs> I mean, when you when you ask what we're gonna do against the other people, right? Make them hungry. Make yeah. them hungry. Right. <laughs> I love it. Um, so, if we now just zoom in on like the um, short and medium term focuses for for Yggdrasil. Um so it sounds like in the short term. You have the reconstruction that is ongoing. Yeah, uh, a couple of the new games are, are happening. The aggregation platform. Can, can you just talk, talk a bit more? Kind of yeah. summarize the short. Yeah, I mean, we're, 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 to summarize, we're we're looking at those four pillars, right? So, so we're in a. Uh, we need to be more efficient and faster. We need to use new tools. We need to use AI. Uh, we need to have engineers doing engineering 
not manual tasks you know every day so so the the, the big drive you know in the short term for the first uh, first three four months was when i when i joined was really to to push through that efficiency drive now we're going towards you know being sustainable and how do we build a sustainable company going forward and that means that every month we look we need to look back at what we did you know consider what we did and and realize can we do it better and um to make you know it, um, lots of small changes always on a monthly basis of of all the things within the company and it's just just try and change the mindset within the company that to be sustainable you have to improve every month like whether that's the commercial team you know speaking to 10 percent more customers every month um, whether it's uh, um, you know mark's team looking at you know can we raise the quality by 10 20 percent every month um, whether it's the engineering team can we be more efficient and and do more every single month you know th this is the the mindset of the company and we have to be disruptive in everything we do mm -hmm. so whether it's uh signing up new people to do peer-to-peer -peer games whether it's looking at new content that we're going to launch whether it's taking over tapa tapa um, <laughs> and making competitors and, hungry and making competitors hungry <laughs> you know because they can't come in and eat um and see our new games you know we, we have to be disruptive and um and it, it's it's a mindset change within the within the company and within the group and and if we follow these these areas and and i i th there's no reason why we won't be successful you know a lot more successful than we already have been and and i would like i said i expect everyone to be talking about yggdrasil much more uh, throughout this year and going forward right and uh, this is a good starting point this conversation for sure and yeah for sure last uh, last question for you today uh, james is um, so if we now zoom out a little bit from a longer perspective all the hard work that you're doing now in the short and medium term where do you want yggdrasil to be in three years time uh, i would like people to be looking at Igrisil the way that we look at Pragmatic and Games Global and Evo today. You know, really simply, like, how did they do it? How did they get there? How do we compete? Um, and, you know, uh, um, and just congratulating them on a job well done, like we should do to the other companies. Yeah, I love that. Clear goals, clear cut. Absolutely. Like it. James, it's really exciting to uh, to have you uh, on here at the podcast today. I'm very excited as well as someone who followed Yggdrasil since the very beginning, uh, since Fredrik started the company back in the day. I, I was uh, lucky to be invited uh, to the uh, Yggdrasil day a, a couple of um, months ago here as well. Mm -hmm. So I heard some of the yeah. updates. It seems like there's a lot of energy in the company, a lot of excitement. So I'm looking forward as well to follow. Thank you. Here, and uh, thanks very much for this uh, for this afternoon as well. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.